I want to welcome each and every single one of you to today's sermon. We are so excited about what God wants to do in our lives in this period of time. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will touch you today. And I pray that the Word will come and touch you today. And I want to welcome each and every single group that is gathering or person that is watching. Maybe you're watching for the first time today. I want to say that God has got an appointment with you. And that when we receive the Word of God, when we open ourselves up for Jesus to come and touch us, we cannot be but changed. We cannot be but um, touched by the Holy Spirit. We cannot be but come into contact with the living bread, the living water, the light, the one who is the resurrection and the life. And uh, before we get into the worship, I want to just ask you today, is there something in your life that you are really trusting God for? Because I believe that Jesus Christ is the revelation of all things and that in Jesus lies your answer when we seek Him first. Before we go into the worship, let's just pray. Father, today we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that you are the revelation of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray that as we are ministering today, that you will touch each and every single person that is listening to this message, that you will touch their hearts. They will be able to hear. They will be able to see in the precious name of Jesus. Father, let us fall in love with you again. Lord, let us, that first love, come and rebuild what needs to be built in the name of Jesus. That has, that has been broken down, Lord. Even that stuff that you has allowed to be broken down, come and rebuild it, Lord, according to your blueprint, according to your plan, according to what you want to build it on. In the name of Jesus. Enjoy the worship. Spend some time with God. And we're going to enjoy the service today. God bless you. There's nothing worth more That could ever come close Nothing can compare Your
Awesome. It's always beautiful to spend some time in the presence of God. We are so dependent. We are so desperate for God's presence. And I believe that the word today is a, it's not only a season word. It's a word that will always remain or always constant. And we're starting a new series, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Because the book of Revelation is, first of all, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not only about all the things that was, uh, that's about to happen, all the things that must come to pass, and all the things that we, that we sometimes have theories around. The center point of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. It's the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. Today's title I've titled, Return to Your First Love. Return to Our First Love. Return to His First Love. But before we get there, let's just get into the Word and see what this all is about. In Revelations 1 verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show to His servants the things that must take place. So Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus gives this message where He is the central theme of, the central part of, we're going to get there now. But He gives it to John, His servant. And He says, tell this to my people, tell this to my church. And this letter is just as relevant today as it was in that day. And I believe God is speaking to us. He's speaking to His people. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to His church in this season. In John, um, John says in Revelation 1 verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So, so John is speaking to the seven churches. But the seven is also called, talking about the seven spirits before the throne of God. Now yes, there's the se- seven giftings of the Holy Spirit. The seven um, uh, types of the Holy Spirit. The seven the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's within that seven spirits as well. But I want to take you to the number seven. The seven churches. The seven spirits. The seven spirit of the Holy Spirit talks about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The seven churches is not only the seven churches in Asia. It's talking about the fullness of the church The body of Christ. That's why that seven churches is just as relevant today. It's talking about the fullness of the church. And when Jesus Christ gives the revelation to John to talk to and give and send to the letters to the church, he's talking to the fullness of the church and seven different aspects of the church and what he wants to speak to. You see, the church looks different. You get different types of pastors, of leaders, evangelists, apostles, denominations, groups of people that gather, get together, and they sometimes do strange things because we don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't talk the same, and we're not supposed to be the same. That's why the move of the Holy Spirit will sometimes differ from place to place where you visit or where you get together according to the calling of the church or the leaders or the pastors, whoever is there. So the seven talks about the fullness of of the church that's why this message is just as relevant today the book of the revelation of jesus christ the revelation of jesus christ in the church today in this season right now what is the revelation of jesus and what 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 does he want us to do in revelation 1 verse 5 it says in from jesus christ the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead remember jesus was resurrected from the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And I just want to stop there. Sometimes we miss the simplicity of the gospel. Sometimes we forget what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. It was like that one man that was crucified next to him. Jesus, today when you enter your kingdom, remember me. You see, I was also there one, at one time in my life. Next to Jesus, lost on my way to hell. But there was a day where I said, Jesus, remember me. Lord, I come and give you my life. And Jesus took me in. I won't say necessarily the reasons I accepted Jesus was necessarily the purest because I had issues in my life. And I thought, well, a lot of these people say that Jesus helped them. Maybe Jesus will help me. But here's the thing. Irrelevant of my motive. My motive, my heart was to give it to God, to give it to Jesus. And Jesus said, here he comes. (laughs) I'm going to catch him off, off, off God. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And Jesus forgave my sins. He took my sins away. And He loved me. And He loved me. And for the first time in my life, I experienced the love of the Father. 
For the first time in my life, I identified with one that loves, with one that gives. And I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Christ. I heard about him. I was brought up in a Christian home, I would say. But I never had a, 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 a encounter with God. And I gave my life to Jesus, the simplicity of the gospel. And I want to tell you today, I believe that God wants to bring us back to the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of His forgiveness. The simplicity of His love. Because if we don't walk out of forgiveness and if we don't walk out of His love, we'll get to the part now where the sermon today is about. But I leave, believe it's such import, so important in our lives. Revelation 1 verse 6 says the following. It says, And made us a kingdom. Listen, it says, It made us a kingdom. Priest to His God and to His Father, to Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John says, me and you are a kingdom me and you are a priesthood remember jesus spoke and he says repent for the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god is at hand it says here and made us me and you the church a kingdom it's a kingdom of light it's a kingdom of hope it's a kingdom of resurrection it's a kingdom of patient endurance and pushing through and walking through but it's also a kingdom of love it is also a kingdom of forgiveness it is also a kingdom of washing one another's feet. It's also, also a kingdom of touching one another and being there for one another and having fellowship with one another. doesn't matter if you have different views. It doesn't matter. Love one another. See the best in one another and try and be Jesus. The other, just the other day, the Lord was reminding me and he said, Yuri, when was the last time you told someone that Jesus loves you? And that day, I, two people, I said, Jesus loves you. And you know what? It's the simplicity of the gospel that people remember. It's the love of God. I'll never forget, if it wasn't for the love of God, I wouldn't have changed. If it wasn't for the love of God, I wouldn't have followed Him. And I want to say to you today that it wasn't because of something I did that I experienced God's love. I didn't know Him. I gave my life to Him and I responded to His love inside of me. And I became a different person. I, I wasn't perfect, that I can promise you. Today I'm also not perfect. I'm, I'm trying to be perfect, but I'm, I'm not. I'm striving to be like Christ, but I'm not. And um, in my strive to be, I fail forward like they say. It's no um, excuse to sin, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sinless. <laughs> I need to say, Lord, come and work in my life. And sometimes we get so proud and arrogant, we think we overcome everything. And just as you take your eyes off the cross and you put yourself, your eyes on yourself and you think you've made it, then you make a mistake. But praise be to Jesus that Jesus is there to love us. The simplicity of the gospel is made us to be a kingdom and priest. Now Jesus is centrum. Remember, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation, revelation of Jesus. And it says in Revelation 1 verse 12, John. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now remember in the tabernacle, there were also the golden, uh, the golden lampstand. But this is what John is seeing. Now look what he sees. And in the midst of this lampstand. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. And the Bible says, if you go read, you could do a bit of research. The robe was just above his feet. It was like kings and priests, the kingly and the priestly Christ that was, that was, that was portrayed. So John is looking and he's turning around to where this trumpet and this, and this sound and this voice is coming from. And he says this chandelier, this, the seven lampstands. And he sees Jesus Christ in the middle of the seven lampstands, right in the middle. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, talking about the holiness of Christ, talking about the perfect. The perfect Christ, talking about the one without sin, talking about the one that's without blemish. Um, like snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire, talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about God in God there's life, talking about in God, God burns away all sin, God burns away all unrighteousness. He is the light, he cannot, darkness cannot withstand the light, talking about who Jesus is. His feet were like burn, uh, burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice like the roar of many waters in his right hand he held the seven stars from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword talking about the word of god and his face was like sun shining in full strength now i want to stop here 
The book revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That what is spoken comes from Jesus, but John sees a picture. Before Jesus gives John the word, he lets him see a picture. And the seven, let me read it for you. In verse one, verse two, in chapter one, verse two, and it says, and Jesus speaks to John, and he says, and the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So before Jesus gives this revelation about what he's about to say, what is about to take place, what he's saying to his church, John sees a vision. The seven lampstands represents the fullness of the church. Seven fullness of the church. Jesus in the center of the fullness of the church. God wants you and me and the Holy Spirit wants to tell you and me today that we need to remember Jesus is in the center of all things. And the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ was specifically spoken and given to the church. Specifically spoken and given to the church. Jesus right at the center with the word of God, the sword, the double-edged sword coming out from his, from his mouth. And he's holding, the, he's holding the seven churches in his hand. The seven, talking about the center of the church, but God also holding the churches in his hand. And the angels, he's not, not talking about angels, he's talking about the leadership of the churches. God holds the leadership of the churches in his hands. And I want to tell you today, we have to be sensitive before we just think that anyone is anointed and appointed by God. Yes, all are called. God has got a plan for each and every single one. But be careful that you don't become a Miriam and a, and, a, and a Kura that thought that God can use them in the place of Moses because they were not called in the place of Moses. They were called in a specific function in a place. And we have to accept the place where God has called us. We have to be patient and say, Lord, if this is what you've called me to be, I'm going to be the best I can be. Be very sensitive and be careful not to be pulled into a, 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 a catch of the enemy in that, in that sense. So Jesus is at the center. Now this brings me I laid this as a foundation halfway through the sermon so that you can understand the revelation and what was given to John that he needs to give to the church. Now, he's speaking to the seven churches, but there's not only seven churches. We said he's talking about the fullness of the church. Now, the first section of the church, I think is very important that, that John is speaking and that Christ is addressing. If out of everything in the book of Revelation, this is the first things that Jesus says to the church, I believe it's very important. I believe we have to take note of what Jesus says. So my subtitle and the sermon, the message, core message for today is return to our first love. A return to our first love. I'll never forget as a Bible school student, we had to go on an outreach. And I, I promise you, me and my one friend, we probably had the one song Goma on the corner and he gave his life to Christ. I don't think he did it willfully. I think he did it out of, out of fear uh, for us. And, and you might say, but Yuri, that's not right. Maybe it wasn't right. And I agree with you. But here's the thing. I was so passionate for Jesus. I was so on fire for Jesus. To me, it was like every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Was I perfect? No, I wasn't. Was I extreme? Definitely I was extreme. But I was in love with Jesus. And it's like God is speaking to me in the season. He says, Yuri, I want you to return to your first love. And it's so difficult sometimes because we say, yes, Lord, but I'm so busy with all your things. And I want to be busy with all your things and all these things that I think I must be busy with. <laughs> it's like the Lord says, just come back to me. Come back to my heart. Come back and come sit with me and let me spend some time with you. Let me share with you. Let me impart to you. Let me put my blueprint for your life on you. Don't try and look like other people. Look like I've created you. Try and speak like I want you to speak. Just be what you've been called to be. Sometimes we're trying to be like everybody else in the world. But you're not everybody else in the world. You're just you. You won't be able to be you if you don't sit with Jesus and allow him to come and show you who you really are. Who you really are. We've got a choice. We can go into the world and want to go change the world. I want to look like everybody else so that everybody can be impressed with us and we can shine for Jesus and get the attention that we think we're going to get because of that. I want to tell you that there's no more of attention that we need than the attention of Jesus with his eyes and his gaze fixed on me and you because we're sitting there with him alone. We treasure him the time we spend with him alone. Forget about the world. Forget about all the people. Forget about everything and everyone. That you want to go and touch for Jesus and look at the King of Kings first. Come back to the first love. 
And it's interesting that Jesus speaks first. So in Revelation 2, verse 2, it says, Jesus says to this section of the church, it was the church of Ephesus, a well-established church. But listen to what he says. He says, I know your works. He says to this church, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those that are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary so god comes first <laughs> and like he is jesus and he comes and he commends them the first section the first part the first thing that he says to the church i know your works he says i know that you patiently enduring he says it twice patiently enduring which gives me the point to believe that they were actually standing on the fact that they were patiently enduring and they were becoming proud in that in that fact we are patiently enduring look at our works we are standing firm look at me i'm going through this through the fire look at me i'm enduring where the focus should be on the dependence on jesus it has become because it was a well-established church and the people have been growing in maturity and even character the focus has slowly slifted away from the king of kings towards their own ability towards their own endurance towards their own and what they are suffering what they are going through makes me think of myself sometimes because we say, oh, I'm suffering. Oh, I'm fighting the good fight of faith. I love that because that's my favorite. I am fighting the good fight of faith. But Jesus is fighting it for me and through me by the power of his Holy Spirit. That's why I can overcome. That's why all things work together for good. That is why nothing can come against you because God is for us. Amen. It's not me. It's him that's within me. It's not me. It's His strength, His power, His Holy Spirit that enables us. And I can promise you, if you want to try and do it in your own strength, <laughs> you will find yourself at a place where you quickly know that you can't do it in your own strength. So this section, he says, I know your works. It makes me think of that piece in the New Testament where they're coming to Jesus and they say, Lord, I've done this and Lord, I've done that and Lord, I've done this. And then Jesus says to them, go away from you. I never knew you. I never knew you. It's not talking about this church because they knew Jesus. But here Jesus says, he doesn't say, I know you. He says, I know your works. I know your works. I know what you're doing. You doctrinally sound. You can discern a, a, a false doctrine when it comes in the door. You can discern a false apostle and an evangelist and a teacher when they walk in the door. Your discernment is sharp. Your theology is sharp. You're tough. You're enduring. That's what he says. I know it. I know it. And then he says in Revelation 2 verse 4. And this struck me to my core. And it said, but this I have against you. It's like a balance sheet, credit and debit. So on the credit side, all their works and what they've done. And the fact that they're standing strong and they're discerning. And they're th th morally and theology, th th theology wise, they sound. Amen. He says, but this I have against you on the other side. That you've abandoned the first love. That you had it first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless, unless you repent. Yet this you have once again on the, on the credit side. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans. And I also hate. They were doing the right things. They were doing the right things. And when I said from where you have fallen. That reminded me of another piece in the Bible where he says he saw the devil fall out of like a, like a falling star. You see, when one falls from where, where you're falling, it's a place of love. It's a place of resurrection. It's that place of Jesus died for me on the sins and the cross of Calvary. And that's the only thing almost I'm excited about. Why? Because I'm fervently and passionately in love with Jesus and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. And I want to say to myself and to you and whoever is listening today, the gospel of Jesus Christ, His love for us, is central to the church. It's central to who we are. It's central. We can be theology sound. We can write commentaries. We can do everything we want to do. We can discern each prophet and teacher and apostle and evangelist and say who's right and who's not right and who's off and where off. We can do all of those things and we can endure patiently. We can be tough. But if we don't have the love of God in our hearts, if we're not in love with Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus would rather close the church. Because when he's talking about coming to take out the candlestick, he's talking about coming to close the church. 
And it sh uh, this shocked me because I thought, yes, but Lord, the church is your, the body of Christ. And I mean, these acts were theology, the um, uh, sound doctrine. They were discerning. And it shows me what is important to Jesus. Those things are important. I know your works. He didn't put it against him. He put it on the credit side. It's for you. But this I've got against you. My people need the love of Jesus. My people need the love of Christ. My people need to know that their sins have been forgiven. Their sins have been forgiven. The focus should be on the cross of Calvary. The focus should be on the cross of Calvary. Can it be that me and you as Christians and sometimes you know, character and sometimes in the time period that we spend with God and sometimes in the walk that we come, walk with God, we become proud of how who we are. We become proud of how strong we maybe become. We become proud because I can discern and I can do these things that we lose. We lose our first love. That we focus, our shift, we shift our focus to the wrong place. You know, the others, like yesterday, I had this, just this thought that came into my head. You know, we're praying and trusting for revival, and revival needs to break out. And I'm also trusting for that. But for a moment, it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, can it be that the shift and the focus is going from the sun to revival? That we are so, in a sense, focused on revival and, and this thing that needs to happen, that we, we've taken our eyes of the Son of God. We've taken our, our eyes of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've taken off our eyes from the one that actually revives and brings revival. Maybe we should stop looking at the things that we're looking and searching for and pay, take our eyes back to the King of Kings, to the revelation of Jesus Christ, to the fact that our sins are forgiven. We've got something to be excited about. Something that we can stand up in the morning and say, I've got a song in my heart because my sins are forgiven. But you know, a lot of times we're standing up and we're complaining. Me, I'm talking to me. I'm not even talking to some of you, I'm talking to me. We're complaining. And we're moaning and we're groaning about the things that we have to endure. The things that we have to go through. The people that, that come against us. The people that, that hurt us. The people that, that go against, or do whatever against us. But we forget that Jesus Christ died for me and for you on the cross of Calvary. And there's no bigger miracle. There's no bigger reward. There's no, nothing bigger that could be ever be done for me or for you. And we shift our focus to the wrong places. In this place, believe that um, this year is the year to put God first. Our core scripture is love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your body like you, and your, your neighbor as yourself, your whole soul and your neighbor as yourself. Maybe our attention should be back to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit who, who is the intermediate between us and God and the fact that He died for us on the cross of Calvary. Maybe that should be enough for us. Maybe that should... Fan the flame in our hearts. And not all the other things we want Jesus to do for us. Because sometimes we more love with what we can do for, do for Jesus. What D Jesus can do for us. Than we in love with the King of Kings himself. Sometimes we're so in love and we're so chasing what we can do for Jesus. Or what he can do for us. That we forget he's the one to be loved. He's the one to be behold. He's the one that is awesome. And I want to close with this thought. I want to ask you today. How does your passion and your love look for Jesus? Because I know mine can do better. I know I've got some, 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 some work to do in my own personal life and my time that I spend with Jesus because I'm preaching as one that can do better. I need to do better in that area. Not as a work. It has to be something that comes from my heart to Jesus. And if it's you today, I want to pray with you. If it's you today that say, Yuri, my focus has been going, I've been focused on all the other stuff and I've been taking my eyes off the King of Kings. I want to rekindle the love that He has for me. I want to pray for you. Father Lord, I pray for each person listening right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, it says faith is as small as a mustard seed. Lord, it says your word that is spoken from your mouth cannot return to you empty. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that your logos and your rima word will ignite a fire and you will put a seed in our hearts that will be like the mustard seed, Lord, that it will be a fruit that is pleasing and an aroma that is pleasing to you. I pray for each one right now. If that's you, just pray with me. Father, I come to you today, Lord. Lord, I repent. I repent from where I've missed it. I repent from, 
from that by fact that my eyes were in the wrong place. I repent from that, Lord. Lord, light the fire. Light your, your relationship with me, my love for you, your love for me. Ignite that in my heart. In the name of Jesus. Lord, here I am. Take, take me. Take hold of me. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say this before I close. The word repent, um, it's metanoia. Meta talks about meta position, the point where you're moving from. The metanoia talks about changing your mind, uh, changing the way you think. So repentance in general is to have an attitude change about how you look at something and what's right and wrong and starting to live according to it. Amen. So something's wrong. I know that's wrong. I'm going to repent from doing that thing. I've got to change my mind. I'm going to live the right way. But here's the thing, the, the, the base word on the right hand side, the, the third base word, I never knew that, is also of repentance, is to know God, gnosto, to know God. So repentance and to know God goes hand in hand. So God can know, maybe know your works, but if God doesn't know us, me and you, with our relationship to Him, we are not truly repented. And this is not a work, this is something in your heart. Amen. So I bless you. I pray that God will be with you. If, you wanna, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, go sit with Jesus. It will be the easiest decision you make in your life to give Him your life. He will forgive your sins, but it will cost you your life because you will live the rest of your life for the King of Kings. What a, what a privilege. It won't always be easy, but it's not supposed to be easy, but it will be to His glory. May God bless you, me, keep you, and know that He loves you so, so much. He will never, ever stop loving you. God loves you. God bless you. Amen.